afternoon, we're speaking with Theo Hobson. Dr. Hobson is a British theologian. He was educated at St. Paul's School in London. He read English literature at the University of York, then theology at Cambridge University, where he was a member of Hughes Hall. Dr. Hobson researched the strongest voices of the Protestant tradition, Martin Luther, Kierkegaard, and Karl Barth. His Ph.D. thesis became the basis of his first book, The Rhetorical Word, a book that studies the role of authoritative rhetoric in Protestantism. And today, we're eager to be discussing his newest book, Reinventing Liberal Christianity, a book published by Erdman's in 2013. We're so glad to have you, Dr. Hobson. Thanks. Good to be here. Dr. Hobson, when speaking of, quote, liberal Christianity, you distinguish between two streams, the stream that you would like to see reinvented, this good stream, uh, you want to see it flourish, the stream that you say you would like to have reinvented, and the stream that, quote, wants to see the flourishing of Christian culture within the liberal state. And then there's this other stream, this negative stream. How, how, do you, how did you come to differentiate these two streams in your own thinking, and when did you decide to write this book calling for the reinvention of liberal Christianity? Yeah, well, it's something I've always been thinking about, really, ever since I was a teenager, really. I was very much drawn to the liberal tradition of Anglicanism, is my tradition, Church of England. Mm -hmm. uh, but within that, I'm very drawn to the, the most kind of liberal reforming wing of it. Um, and in some ways, I reacted against that as I studied theology in more detail. But I didn't react uh, fully. I didn't settle in any other point of view. So I think I was always with one foot in liberal theology and one foot criticizing it. Hmm. And I began to want to work out how that, how that works. So is there a way of bringing, bringing them together and creating a, a synthesis, hmm. two strands of Protestantism together? Hmm. Um, and I gradually came to see that it was possible, I think. There's, the book comes from the belief that it is possible to reform the tradition. And I think we need to do that by reacting against the liberal, rationalist, enlightenment tradition. That's the problem. That's in the way of authentic liberal hmm. Christianity. Hmm. Let me ask you, sir. Uh, liberal Christianity boasts a very proud heritage. It has figures in its past such as Walter Rauschenbusch, Reinhold Niebuhr, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, who are some of the influential authors in liberal Christianity today whom you'd recommend that we read or that gave the movement that you grew up in identity? Well, the problem is it's a very fragmented tradition, so that's a really difficult question to answer. I think I, I would stress the need to just go back through the tradition and reread a lot of the big figures in a critical way. Uh, I'd, I'd start with Luther. I think he's very important. Um, but I would also go on to people in the 17th and 18th centuries who are really grappling with the political questions of how do we combine Christianity with liberal politics. And there I'm thinking of people like John Milton and also people in the American tradition, including some of the founding fathers, who are um, really grappling with this idea of um, separation of church and state, that kind of issue. So we need to look look hard at that tradition, but we also need to be critical of that and say, well, what were they missing? You know, where did they go wrong? And 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 then we need to look at more modern theologians like Karl Barth, who criticised that whole Enlightenment liberalism, and in a way, he's paradoxically an important resource for what I'm saying because hmm. we do need to criticise. Uh, the humanistic kind of Enlightenment liberalism. So it, it's such a complicated tradition that I would emphasize the need to go back and look at these major figures in, in, rather than um, people writing today. Mm. And, and of course, of course uh, I, I'm drawing on recent theologians as well, but in fact the most, the most interesting theologians are actually people I disagree with, I mm. think, a lot. Um, more of the post-liberal people have, have really been the most important theologians in the last 20 years or so. Hmm. Um, and, and although I disagree with them in a fundamental way, I think they have important insights that, that can feed into the thesis.
One of the principal objectives of this book, as you write in the introduction, is, quote, to show how a form of Christian idealism founded the liberal state. This is perhaps unsurprisingly neglected by secular thinkers, you continue, who suppose that liberalism is an essentially secular narrative. More surprisingly, the most influential theologians agree, for they see liberalism as an essentially anti-Christian tradition. This fairly simple narrative, that liberalism was a secular invention, suits both secularists and conservative theologians, but it is false. So, let me get this right. Liberalism is the child of Christianity, you're arguing in this book. Please help us to understand this idea that you present. Mm. Well, I would put the emphasis on the emergence of the liberal state. Um, liberalism is, in a way, a slippery term. It might be best to get away from that. Hmm. I would put the emphasis on the rise of a new sort of politics that I date from the mid-17th century. That's kind of the English Civil War time, or Cromwell kind of time. Uh, and then a little bit later, John Locke. And as you know, that feeds into the American Revolution in the following century. Hmm. Uh, but that's the kind of tradition I'm talking about, liberal political tradition, where thinkers are moving away from the theocratic model of the state, saying that you need to have a unified church and state in order to create order. It's a radically new idea, comes along in the 1640s or so, that actually we can create a whole new politics where religious freedom is fully respected and we don't need to rely on coercion and religion, all this sort of thing, which is absolutely taken for granted as basic to secular, liberal, uh, humanistic thought of the West today, uh, which, I, which I affirm strongly that, that the whole tradition Christians should affirm. And yes, I'm saying that does come from a form of Protestant idealism. It, it first came from some of the radical reformers, and it was adapted uh, by more politically engaged thinkers. Hmm. So it's a complicated tradition. Hmm. I think that'll be a new idea for some of our listeners, that Protestantism actually helped give rise to the secular state. Would you be willing to give an outline just of that, uh, that core of the idea? What, what writers were producing literature, or uh, what specific... Uh, contributions did these authors make to that movement? Mm. Well, someone I focused on a lot is John Milton, the English poet mm. and polemicist. And he was criticizing the Church of England, which he said was too much like the Catholic Church. And he was also criticizing the Calvinists, because they also had a model of theocracy of too much desiring to control everybody's opinion, everyone must believe the same doctrines and so on. He said, no, we don't need churches to boss people around like that. We can have a new culture of freedom in which people choose how to worship and what to believe. Of course, it's a bit more complicated than that because there's a need to resist other forms more reactionary theocratic forms that might come back in, like Catholicism most obviously. So it can't be simply tolerant of everything, but is it is a revolution in thought and it's Christians, such as John Milton, uh in fact Roger Williams is also an important one who goes over to the to uh, the colonies to mm -hmm. Rhode Island. And uh he's a, he's an important influence on that tradition in America. Mm. Uh, so I would, I, I would say that they're both important. And then I would say, in a slightly different way, Jefferson and Madison in the next century are important, just because they emphasize the separation of church and state. Hmm. Uh, they're, they're, to my mind, too influenced by the humanistic deism, but nevertheless, they have uh, an important insight into the need uh, to establish religious freedom as essential to politics. And that's the Republican tradition that I'm sure your listeners mm. will be familiar with mm -hmm. and will sympathize with strongly because it's mm. basic to the United States. Mm. 
Dr. Hobson, some conservative evangelicals looked to the, quote, fundamentalist modernist controversy in the early part of the 20th century and the subsequent exodus of J. Gresham Machen from Princeton Seminary as the story of their beginning as a distinct movement. Uh, are these also significant stories for liberal Christians, this uh, tumultuous change that took place in the beginning of the 20th century. What are some of the foundational stories about the identity of liberal Christians th uh, that you will hear told in these circles? Well, I think that's, that's another difficult question. As I've said, it is a fragmented tradition, and it, it extends right from Martin Luther to Martin Luther King. Hmm. And that's a long time, and a lot happens in between those times. Um, but I think that liberal Christians do need to basically affirm that development I've been trying to talk about, the emergence of liberal politics, and they need to say this is not just a secondary matter. This is something essential to authentic Christianity. We believe mm. that God wills a new form of political freedom, uh, and that is very basic, basic to the West. And of course, it's a slow story, and there's no absolutely defining moment where you say, here it is. Um, and that's unfortunate. It would be nice if we could point to one event and say, there it is. Hmm. It suddenly happened. But if I had to choose any, I'm quite sympathetic to the English Civil War mm -hmm. and then the American Revolution as two pivotal points in, in at least the political side of the mm. story, but that's not everything. Mm. And yet, as difficult as it is perhaps to nail down uh, the specific story of the genesis of this movement, uh, yet you have a very clear vision of what happens when this, um, when this movement does not have a voice or does not have a contribution, does not fully, is mm. not enabled to make that contribution to the broader Christian world. Why is liberal Christianity so important? Why are you why are you passionate that this movement be reinvented? Well, I think it simply makes Christianity available to people in the West who are convinced by the accounts of liberalism in a broad sense, hmm. who say, yeah, we believe in freedom, we believe in equal rights, we believe in um, a secular political order, mm -hmm. and those sort of people, which um, is probably the majority, they should be shown that those concerns are compatible with Christian faith. And if they are not shown that, then they are very, very likely mm. to reject Christian faith as something backward, something reactionary. Um, and of course, you know, there is a tension within Christianity of progress and reaction, but it's important for them to be able to see the strong, strong basis that Christianity has in Western values, hmm. and that means humanism, liberalism, and so on. And I'm, I'm very um, wary of a kind of theology that simply dismisses where, uh, liberal, liberal values as being a temptation or a distraction. You know, hmm. We need to see that it is, it is important to combine the two things. Hmm. Dr. Hobson, you argue that Protestantism's failure to engage in, quote, sacramentalism is one of the primary reasons why liberal Christian theology, which you take to be a positive thing, led to secular liberalism, which you take to be a negative thing. Do I understand your argument rightly? And how does this work? What can liberal Christianity do now to reinvent its sense of sacramentalism? Yeah, well, according to my kind of argument, liberal Protestantism became very narrow, it became very rationalistic, and it moved away from anything really substantially Christian in a way. It just bought in much too heavily to the idea of humanist, rational humanist progress, of the moral um, capability of human beings, and also the rational critique of 
religious mythology, religious ritual, and so on. And that was that turned out to be a massive problem that that led to a kind of arid form of semi-religion that really drifted into agnosticism in the 19th century or so. And someone like Karl Barth is quite right that, you know, a massive reaction is needed. We need to rediscover Christianity's basis in faith, obviously, but to my mind also in ritual. So there's a need to, in a way, look again at the move away from Catholic sacramentalism and say, hang on, you know, we need to think again and see that there was an overreaction against that sort of thing, against worship with images, against the sacraments as very central to worship and the Eucharist and so forth. Mm. And when a form of Protestantism dismisses that as dangerously Catholic or pagan even, it's in trouble because it's very likely to move into a rather bloodless rationalism. And I'm simply saying that we need to remember that Christianity is based in worship. It's a cultic thing. Mm. And how can we recover that sense of sacramentalism today? Well, I think um, partly it's a matter of reaffirming what happens in worship. Partly it's a matter of trying to think afresh about the Eucharist especially, but also other forms of ritual and saying, why is this so important? How does it work? And thinking about these things is difficult, you know, because they Mm. are, in a sense, uh, difficult to think about by definition because they're not based in language in the same way as other things. It's Mm. more about performance of something physical. Uh, But there are some important thinkers who help us to reflect on that, and that's one aspect. I'd also say that the arts is very important. Hmm. Uh, That includes literature, that includes visual arts, uh, theater, that kind of thing. I think we we as theologians need to make connections between the arts and worship, uh, partly in order to draw people in and say, look at what we're doing in worship. It's very strongly related to what you're doing when you go to the theater or what you do when you're looking at paintings and so on. And hmm. I think with those sort of connections, we can we can re- rediscover that um, religion is not just about ideas, it's about culture and doing things. Hmm. Dr. Hobson, the 1960s were a tumultuous decade by all counts, and it was also such an important period for the development of liberal Christianity what happens in the 1960s that's so pivotal for your thesis? Well, actually, I have a fairly negative view of the 1960s from my argument's point of view. I think it was largely about the uh, the last gasp of the bad old days of the humanistic form of liberal Protestantism, hmm. where, in a way, the, the critique of Karl Barth or somebody was, somewhat ignored, and there was a lot of rather naive belief in simply reaffirming um, what I would call the deist humanist narrative of human beings have innate potential and that rational morality is the essence of Christian religion and so on. You get that in in certain interpretations of um, Protestant tradition. You get it in someone like Bultmann's demythologizing, uh, you get it in the interpretations of Bonhoeffer that were being made then. And so, so an idea that we can just move into a secular morality and that will do, that's, that's the, the future of Christianity. And that's, and that's naive in my view, because it, lo- it, do- it doesn't see what went wrong in Protestant tradition. It doesn't mm. see that there was this massive overinvestment in the rational, in the humanist, uh, and in progress, and in all those sort of things. It fails to see that we need to return to the core business of worship, of ritual, of faith, and so on, and we need to reconcile that with the political, the political side of things. Mm. Freedom and so on. So 
it wasn't a great decade in my opinion um but i think i think maybe it was it was a necessary one for theology to react against that and then it could start thinking more more clearly hmm. and what does liberal christianity need to learn from this period of the 1960s in order to reinvent itself today um i think it's it's always important to see where the temptations lie, where, where it's possible to go wrong. And I think one aspect of that was a rather excessive belief in um, religious socialism. I think that's a, that's a constant dilemma for liberal Protestants, I think, that sort of almost utopian belief that we can bring about the kingdom of God on earth, you know, elements of that came in and I don't entirely dismiss that whole tradition it's an important part of the tradition but of course it needs to be balanced with more traditionally theological concepts of sin of God's grace and so on and that's a very difficult balancing act but mm. it's important to go back and look at what people uh, were saying then how they were trying to grapple with that mm. in order to think about what we can do now Hmm. Dr. Hobson, thank you so much for speaking to us. Uh, let me just commend this book to our listeners. This is an amazing book. It's one of the very few theology books that I've seen in a long time that's a real page-turner. It's a pleasure to read, very smartly written. And Dr. Hobson, if I can ask just one final question. Hmm. It's a question that we've been asking all of our uh, guests on this program, and that is this. Despite the tremendous diversity of the expression that we witness among Christians around the world, what is it that gives the church her essential unity? Well, I think that the church is united by authentic worship, I would say, authentic worship of Jesus Christ. And that means um, a, a, deep, a deep respect for the, the ancient creedal traditions and the forms of worship that we find, you know, right from the beginning, even in the New Testament. So that that's really the essence of it. But also from my point of view, I would say that authentic Christianity will really wrestle with this question of um, Western liberal values, and it won't just turn its back on that, but it will say, how can we how can we find God's will throughout the good of human freedom and human equality? These sort of values, they're not secondary, but they're primary. So how can we bring that in and say that that too belongs to the essence of the gospel? Mm -hmm. It's been our pleasure this morning to be speaking with Dr. Theo Hobson and speaking about his book, Reinventing Liberal Christianity. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Pleasure.